You're watching Jim Cannell on Today Television. This is Bible Study for the 21st Century. Friends, I'm always happy to bring special guests your way. I try to bring people your way who have a proven track record out there in ministry or in, in accomplishment in the world. Dave Wells is no exception. You know, we'll be meeting him in a moment. He is the uh, General Superintendent of the Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada. He's chaplain for the Olympics, for the Pan American Games. He has a vast international background and he's just a fascinating guy to talk to. And you're gonna enjoy the interview. So you hang in for that. And then of course the Bible teaching will come after Wells. Everyone has a story. We'd love to hear about yours. Write to us and tell us about it. JimCannellOnToday.com And David Wells is back with us, and I'm so happy he's with us all this month. Five Sundays this month. Wow. Christmas on the way, David. Mm -hmm. Hardly. Feliz Navidad. Well, Feliz Navidad. So you're, you're, you're also bilingual. Joyeux Noel. <laughs> oh, trilingual. Whoa. Uh, David is the general. I just like presents. Oh, well, there you go. The general superintendent of the Pentecost Assemblies of Canada. We've been having a great discussion in the last couple of weeks. David, I want to shift gears a little bit here. When was it that you had this sense that you wanted to get involved with um, caring for the spiritual needs of world-class athletes at events like the Olympics and the Pan American Games. How did that all come together? Yeah, I mean, it's one of the great uh, joys of my life to have had that tracking, and it started uh, in the 80s. We were living in Calgary, and uh, I became aware through a conference about uh, uh, the express need that, uh, for instance, Canada's world-class athletes, uh, there was like a spiritual vacuum in how they were uh, cared for and uh, even their ability to express faith and maybe even lack of faith mm -hmm. amongst uh, many athletes and uh, the whole question about how to serve and care for the whole athlete. And that's, that's a critical thing in mm -hmm. uh, sports uh, with world-class athletes and high-performance athletes is uh, there's a danger of them being treated uh, just for performance. Yeah. And uh, so often working with medical people, working with psychologists, working with others that surround athletes about how do you care for the whole person. So I got very motivated about that. And then I'm in Calgary, the Olympics are coming. I'm working with a lot of young people. I talk to the organizers and say, how, how can young people be involved? And I've got people coming in, in even internationally that want to be involved. And, uh, so they brought me on as a volunteer, not specifically about chaplaincy, mm -hmm. but just to involve young people in the Olympics in Calgary. And while doing that, um, the international guests, some of them were sports chaplains. And so here you had this merger of something I'd been feeling uh, very concerned about with I met some of the actual people that were engaging athletes. Uh, a lot of Europeans were there, Americans and so on. No Canadians. Mm. So they looked at me and they said, Canada should be there and we're going to be in Seoul for the Summer Olympics. Uh, that's back in the days when they were in the same year. So yeah. September, why don't you come over and be at our sports congress and uh, see if you can pursue that. By 1990, I was engaged uh, with the Commonwealth Games team that went down to Auckland, New Zealand. Uh, I was able to be there through the bereavement, uh, one of the athletes losing her father right before the Games. Mm. Here's the thing, she's in pair synchro, and if she goes home because of her father's passing, what about her teammate and so on? So I'm working with those women related to that, but also the grief and the team mm -hmm. and so on. And 
I think it uh, proved to bring some sense of the validity of having a chaplain engaged with the team as well as, again, coaches, mm -hmm. trainers, psychologists, mm. and uh, away we went. And so since 1990, there's been, uh, I think I'm up about to 18 major sporting events that uh, I've been privileged to be at least one of, if not the Canadian guy at it, uh, some of the games to actually coordinate the faith centers. Uh, Olympic level events, uh, accredited events, be it the Olympics or Pan Ams, it's expected that you'll have the five major faith groups represented. So it takes the acumen of working with those from other faiths as well, which I view as a privilege and yeah. make some great friends mm -hmm. on the journey. And uh, so just those opportunities have followed. And after a while, I guess if you're viewed as credible, go, go figure, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, then. Uh, you're the guy to go to. And I've had the privilege then of bringing on other Canadians and, of course, people younger than myself to allow uh, them to uh, also begin to gain experience in these kind of major events, working with athletes. And then you track with them between events, of course. It's not just about the event. It's about the person and, and uh, who God puts you into contact with. Now, in, in coordinating uh, the various uh, five major faith groups, uh, has that fallen to you now to do that? Uh, when I'm when I'm asked by the organizing committees to actually organize uh, the faith centers at the events, then that's my responsibility. So that happened at the Vancouver uh, Olympics and Paralympics, happened at the Pan Am and Parapans, uh, all the way through to recently the Invictus Games that were in Toronto just over a year ago. Uh, and then when you go to other settings where you're the Canadian guy, but you arrive, and of course, if it's set up according to best practices, right away you're going to be meeting some Muslim friends, Buddhist friends, and right. so on. The acumen about how to relate is so essential. Oh, yeah. And frankly, I'm a Canadian. Yeah. In our culture today, you better have that acumen and be able to show mutual respect. And uh, I always tell the organizers, I'm here to make sure you don't have a religious war, <laughs> which they kind of appreciate. <laughs> uh, Canadians uh, are ideal for these kinds of roles. Uh, we don't offend anybody, and uh, we're kind, and we're always apologizing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'm well trained. <laughs> uh, have you had any um, uh, crisis moments uh, over the years when it came to working with the various faith groups and or perhaps outsiders who are misreading what's going on? Yeah, I mean, uh, there's always, uh, for some people, this whole question of why, why are we paying to have these games and then uh, have religion happening? You know, right. there's the uh, strong opinion that uh, that doesn't belong mm. in what they perceive as a secular event. Mm -hmm. Well, they're totally misreading it because the athletes aren't secular. No. They're looking for faith expression. Yep. Uh, we are setting up a town, a village, uh, for all the services that they would normally find at home. So you get that kind of questioning opposition. Uh, there's been tensions at times with coaches because coaches are about the performance and yep. they feel like they've got to help their athletes, some of them at least, not get distracted by anything and by anything they mean it's not just you know some chaplain it's a religion it's it's family it's loads of other things as well and this became part of the issue over the years about athletes not in having this whole life and this wholeness about them that would actually help them sustain their athletic careers they, they were being brought down to just being performance animals mm. well what do you expect yeah. you're going to have breakdown and it's not just physical, it's emotional, and it's spiritual. Well, as we've discovered in the last few uh, years with the Me Too movement and uh, the revelations about mm -hmm. sexual abuse, especially of female athletes by team doctors and so on, mm -hmm. a lot of these, and, then, and, and most of them are still kids, mm -hmm. are very high performing athletically, but maybe dying on the inside and suffering great uh, emotional stress. Yeah, and, and the reality is, is I've worked with athletes who were, in essence, uh, not not in sort of uh, a legal way being abused, but we're in abusive relationships. We're really feeling to mean the one safe place they felt they had, and it was safe because you honor their privacy, was the chapel and coming to see the chaplain. And you'd hear stories along that lines. 
Other times it was uh, to be there. I mean, you're talking about performance, and suddenly you have uh, a loser die at the Olympics. Yeah. That your, you know, huge grief goes through the entire place. All of a sudden, how do you be there for the athletes? How did you How did you deal with that one, David? Because I knew you were there when that happened. How, how did you deal with that? Yeah, I was in charge of the Faith Center, and we had talked through the scenario of a critical incident with the organizers, Lee. And so, before it was even public that he had passed away, the uh, VP of the Games responsible for the Villages came and said, David, we really need you. And I didn't have a clue. I was actually doing some troubleshooting in the multi-faith center. Right. And, uh, and then he made me aware of this. So in becoming aware of that, we had understood the role that we would play to come alongside of the entire village team. I mean, we had volunteers in, weeping in the chapel. We had uh, athletes not knowing if they could go back up on that loose track because that was their friend who had mm. died. Mm. And, uh, you know, the chapel was there. But we were also able, we, the power of remembrance and uh, to set up a remembrance room and uh, privacy so that they could come, light a candle, put their name in the book of condolences that went to mm. his family in Georgia, you know, mm. and uh, just for them to have somebody to talk to and debrief with. Sometimes that was chaplains, also the organizers had counselors available mm. as well. We provided counsel. Mm. So, uh, you know, it, it's riveted in my mind. I was at Whistler this summer. I went in the village mm. to the memorial mm. uh, to that young Georgian loser and I paused and I thought about the value of life mm. and uh, Olympics are great. Um, you know, Whistler's got some of the legacy of that, but one of the legacies is that memorial mm. and that an athlete is more than just their performance. I was struck by um, the pall of sorrow that descended on the Olympics mm. when that young man was killed. And um, so many commentators, both those who were professionals behind the mic and then those who were just interviewed in what we call streeters mm -hmm. in, in the village, saying a gold medal is irrelevant compared to the value of a life. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I could see that a lot of the athletes, and I'm sure you did because of your intense and intimate involvement there, were really uh, re-examining themselves, some of their values in the light of that death. Yeah, uh, we had major conversations, discussions, and yeah. you know, it continues on in different contexts. I was with the Commonwealth Games team when the Humboldt tragedy occurred mm. right away, uh, helping the team, again, setting up a place for a uh, condolence book and for them to be able to come and just think about life for a period of time rather than performance. And uh, then you move on from that uh, moment and, uh, the athletes are asking different questions and then we had I had the opportunity to visit with them just you know that was this spring and it just keeps striking you over and over again people have to be treated in the whole yeah you've got to see the whole person you've yeah. got to value the whole person uh, performance matters yeah. no one's demeaning yeah. that but yeah. I think whole people can better perform than uh, you know just uni focused mm. uh, it, it breaks down after a period of time a uh, powerful word to end this interview on, uh, David. Uh, David Wells, the General Superintendent of the Pentecost Assemblies of Canada, and also uh, a major player in the chaplaincy of world-class athletic events now for well over 10 years in our world. Great to have you with us. David will be back with us next program. We'll take a break and I'll be back with our Bible study. Jim Kennel on Today is a program dedicated to the teaching of the good news of Jesus Christ. This all through the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. JCT also brings to you encouraging testimonies and stories from Christian leaders all over the globe. If this program has added value to your life, would you please consider becoming a partner? To do so, simply contact us by phone, mail, or online. Last time I took some time on this passage where Jesus is responding to a young lawyer who's basically asking what's at the bottom line. And Jesus said, you shall, here's what's at the bottom line, love God 
and love your neighbor. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And last program, I analyzed heart, soul, mind, and strength in terms of intellect, emotion, and will. You love God with how you think, you love God with how you feel, and you love God with the decisions you make. It's not some you know, fuzzy, nebulous thing. It's uh, very much feet on the ground, especially on the decision-making level. But something that is often missed here, or can be missed, or glossed over here, is a part of that sentence. You shall love, uh, the first commandment is, is as second, um, for, let me get back to it. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. As yourself. I know it's a multi-billion dollar industry out there. The industry of self-help books and videos. And who knows how much is spent, you know, visiting various counselors and experts on how to improve one's self-esteem and self-image. And I can appreciate that. We all want to strive for excellence and we all want to maybe look better, be better, act better, think better of ourselves. Nothing wrong with that pursuit, I don't think. However, it seems that, you know, after you've read your 10th self-help book, you're finding writer after writer basically restating the obvious. It almost becomes a form of um, addiction for many people, which can't be a good thing. Uh, it's almost like, you know, another diet, another diet, another diet. This one's going to be the one. This is the one that's going to see me crack off 40 pounds. And of course it doesn't. So it's the next diet, then the next diet, and you become a diet junkie. Well, loving yourself is a difficult thing, especially, and, and I do mean this, especially if your childhood was abusive, especially if you heard negative things from your parents. Uh, you're not good enough, you don't look good enough, you're not as smart as your brother, uh, why can't you be like cousin John? Uh, if they did come to one of your performances, uh, giving you big trouble because you flubbed one of your lines or because you dropped the football at a key moment in the game. Negative, negative, negative. Now, when, when a child in its formative years, you know your brain is developing until you're about 24, 25, so they say, this is all having an impact. It, it registers and it's almost like it's hardwiring your brain to think negatively. And so, you know, you read something like this, love yourself, love your neighbor as yourself. You go, whoa, I, I, I think I get my mind around loving God and neighbor, but I, I can't love me. I understand. Jesus says you can do it. And just as you love God with your intellect, your emotion, and your will, just as you love neighbor with intellect, emotion, and will, you can love yourself with intellect, emotion, and will. Now, I'm not a psychologist or a, a psychiatric counselor by no stretch. But I do know this. The scripture says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. There is a definite correlation between what we think about ourselves and how we act in our world. If we think nothing but negatives about ourselves, we tend to expect a negative from other people and we approach the world with that demeanor. We may, you know, fake it once in a while with a laugh or a smile or a little humor once in a while, but anybody who knows us knows that we're basically a doom and gloomer. We're, we're down on ourselves and uh, we're, we're the first to put ourselves down. You can love yourself with how you begin to think about yourself. And a good place to start with that is, well, thank God, and gratitude, by the way, is key to all of this. Thank God, I got two eyes that can see, I got two arms that work, two legs that get me around, for those of you who are mobile. Uh, I have a digestive system that seems to be working. Uh, I have food, I have clothing, I have shelter. I mean, these are good things, right? These are positive things, things to be grateful for. There used to be an old song we would sing in church, count your blessings, name them one by one. As you begin to count your blessings, believe it or not, this is an intellectual ex exercise, using your brain. You're getting your thinking engaged. 
and you move on from those initial thanksgivings to maybe more subtle thanksgivings, maybe thanksgivings that relate to only your own personal experience and no one else knows anything about, but you focus on the positive. It's amazing, you know? It's not the power of positive thinking, but what this is is the power of thinking positively about what you have and what you have had and where you are and where you may be going. In fact, as you begin to think positively, you actually begin to develop vision for your future. You love yourself with how you think. You also love yourself with how you feel. And I, again, I fully understand and appreciate uh, the range of emotions in the human heart. I've gone through from some very, very dark periods. I know all about that. A lot of talk these days in our world about depression. I know about that. And then I know a lot about bereavement, too. I know about grieving. I know about loss. Uh, sometimes the darkness can overwhelm you. I fully understand that. There are moments, however, when the emotions are positive. When you can see beyond the, the dark sky. And again, it relates to gratitude and vision. You uh, begin to cultivate those positive feelings. And you begin to speak to yourself positively, even affirming yourself for that good paper you wrote or for that excellent meal you prepared or for that, you know, that terrific uh, way you helped that, um, uh, that friend at work who was going through a difficult time uh, with her marriage breakup. You, you begin to think about some of the value added that you have participated in, the change, however small it may be, that you have made in someone else's life. You begin to think about those things and you begin to cultivate the feelings those things produce in you. And believe it or not, it's self-affirmation, but it's good, it's healthy to affirm oneself. Not to think of oneself more highly than one ought to think, as Paul says in Romans 12, but to think soberly, but to think correctly about how you have been uh, impacting your world. This is called loving yourself, affirming yourself. It's a good thing. And then, of course, will, volition, choices. Choose the better path. Choose the upward hill, knowing that it's maybe going to be a little strenuous getting up there, but you're going to command a great view instead of the downward path. You know, a lot of us stand at a crossroads, and we choose one way or the other. And self-love means you choose the better path. And that better path, in some cases, may be the road less traveled. It could be the path that's going to challenge you. It's going to be more risky. But there's nothing like a little adversity to really develop self-love. Because as you accomplish things in adversity, you become, in the right sense of the word, proud of yourself. Hey, I did that. If I did that, I can do the other thing too. And I'll do something else after that. Slowly, slowly, incrementally, you develop self-esteem. Self-esteem and self-love is kind of like growing a tree. It seems to take forever for that tree to grow. It grows incrementally, ring by ring by ring by ring, and depending whether it's softwood or hardwood, and the kind of tree it is, it may take 60 years to be a mighty oak. But the point is this, in order for it to have reached its 60th year, it had to go through its first year. Increments, increments, increments. You choose incrementally. You choose the better good. You choose something that you know is going to add value to your life and is going to make you proud, in the right sense of the word. This is how you love yourself. You love yourself with your intellect, you love yourself with your emotion, you love yourself with your will. Jesus says it's possible, I believe it's possible, and I know all kinds of people who have just had a turning point when suddenly the light comes on and they realize, I can follow Jesus' plan here and I can love myself and I will do it.
Friends, as you know, Jim Cantillon has been offering Cantillon's casual commentary as a Bible study supplement to his ongoing exposition of St. Matthew's Gospel on JCT TV. He's excited to offer Volume 4, which completes the Matthew study. The Transfiguration, Triumphal Entry, Crucifixion, and Resurrection of Jesus Christ are all covered in this volume. Like the first three volumes, it's concise, captivating, and casual. To order your copy, you can call, write, or go online. Write to Jim Cantillon today, Post Office Box 989 Burlington, Ontario, L7R 3Y7, or call us at 519-415-8341. You can also order online at jimcantillontoday.com. Friends, uh, over the next few months, you're going to be seeing more and more about working for Orphans and Widows. We'll be giving you some video highlights, and uh, I'll give you an occasional report from the field. In fact, in February, I'm going to be in Chennai, India, uh, Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, Johannesburg, South Africa, uh, Accra, Ghana. And in every case, I'm engaging with ministries there that are small but effective, that need us to come along and strengthen their arm in the care of dying orphans and widows. That has been my calling now for almost 20 years, to care for orphans and widows in their distress. You know, the scripture says that God is a father to the fatherless, a defender of widows. And I believe he's calling us to be his hand extended to the least of these. That's what I do in my real job. <laughs> this is a real job too, though, because I'm a preacher. I'm a communicator of the gospel. This is my platform. I used to pastor churches, now this is my pulpit. And it's important to add value to your life in terms of the knowledge of the Word of God. But it's also important to understand that we not only have to preach righteousness, we have to practice justice. We need to be involved both with God and neighbor in a loving way. So I would encourage you, when you see those ads on the show for a while, to support it. And I should also let you know that JCT is now the official spokesman for a while. We have a very symbiotic relationship and we work together and supporting wow is supporting jct supporting jct is supporting wow uh, my commentaries are always available to you Catalan's casual commentary you need to write in for yours i'd love to send it to you i'll soon have a full book the fourth copy is coming out just in the next uh, few weeks to complete your set but uh, one way or another friends as we support one another me doing what i do you doing what you do Together we can literally change the world. See you next time. Contact us. Jim Cantillon today. P.O. Box 989, Burlington, Ontario, L7R 3Y7. If you're sending a check, make it payable to Jim Cantillon today. Or visit us online at jimcantillontoday.com and click support.